soil scientists and uh, the organizers of uh, today's event included, particularly uh, Ansar has been very active in uh, uh, making this event happen. Uh, for last uh, several weeks, he has been uh, uh, in touch with the uh, keynote speakers and uh, resource persons. Uh, so today we uh, have a large panel, highly celebrated uh, uh, professionals with us uh, from across the globe, including FAO. Uh, to begin the uh, event, uh, I request our uh, uh, Director, Institute of Soil and Environmental Sciences, uh, Dr. Javed Akhtar, to present his opening remarks. Dr. Javed. Chief Dr. Javed. Dr. Javed sahab, I don't know if he's experiencing any difficulty in uh, getting logged in, then uh, may I go to uh, Dr. Asaf Ali, Vice Chancellor Mohammed Nawashi, University of Agriculture, Multan. Ji. Well, thank you very much, sir. Uh, you know, I really appreciate the initiative taken by the two universities uh, to jointly organize this seminar, which is very important. And I believe uh, we need to focus more and more on it. Uh, sir, we remember that, you know, uh, in 2007, we started a discussion with the, uh, from the book of uh, Al Gore, Earth uh, uh, in Balance, Ecology and the Human Spirit. And, uh, you know, uh, you know my, to my ignorance, I never considered that, you know, it uh, must relate to the uh, biodiversity of the soil also. But uh, essentially, you know, as we proceeded and learned and uh, we appreciate the uh, initiative uh, of FAO to uh, give this, uh, you know, uh, to designate December 5 since 2014 as uh, World Soil Day. And the theme uh, for this is keep soil alive, protect soil biodiversity. Sir, you know, uh, being geneticist, I know the strength of diversity and biodiversity particularly. And uh, uh, essentially, uh, biodiversity uh, uh, has a nexus with the sustainability. So if we have to save something for future, we have to focus more and more uh, on uh, biodiversity of the soil. And, uh, uh, you know, if you, the new initiative, for example, is the use of herbicides, uh, the use of uh, transgenics, for example, they do have uh, uh, their impacts on soil, uh, soil microflora and the soil life uh, which exists there. So in my opinion, uh, you know, now uh, we should, I mean, there has been a work on biofertilizers. But essentially with biofertilizer, we are using, for example, chemical fertilizer, they also impacting the uh, soil uh, microorganisms. So we have to uh, kind of uh, give more strength to uh, our R&D in biofertilizers if we, have, we need to save uh, the soil microorganism and bioflora. So to, uh, this morning, an article appeared in the business news and the Arthur Zarusman and Tanvir from here, this university, they have given some uh, recommendations uh, that, that we should be uh, uh, using, and we all know, the uh, balanced use or judicious use of uh, uh, fertilizers and all agri other agriculture uh, pesticides and herbicides. So the other recommendation they gave is the climate smart agriculture practices. So we do the like, uh, the temperature is also, it's also affecting the soil life uh, and the more exposure to fertilizers, the less water available, the depletion of uh, other nutrients or the, you know, an imbalance has created, uh, disturbed the biodiversity there. The other uh, recommendation is, uh, and we all know about uh, uh, organic matter. Yes, we are uh, deficient in organic matter and that essentially affects the life there. So the other recommendation they have given is minimizing soil erosion, compaction, sanitization, and land sliding by appropriate management. 
planning of land for urban, rural, and agriculture use according to the land uh, capability classification, and then adopting the policy of reduce, use, and recycle to minimize the load of uh, landfills. But top of all, you know, we must, I mean, through these uh, special days, we must uh, need to create awareness, which is very important across the board, you know, the uh, scientists working in entomology or pathology or breeding or biotechnology, whatever, and overall the community also, they should be uh, made aware that, uh, you know, we have a life existing uh, under this island that is very much needed for sustainability and our future generations. So I'm looking forward with this, you know, heavy panel of uh, experts uh, sitting today to deliberate uh, uh, on this issue. And we are looking forward that uh, we will, from today's discussion, we'll have some lessons and we'll carry out these lessons until uh, we reach next uh, December 5, and uh, there we can review what we have done during the year and uh, you know we make our path. So again, my appreciation to you, sir, for leading it, to Javed Akhtar and my team here at Multan to organize this seminar, which is uh, also, we have an uh, electronic poster competition also, where the students are involved. And uh, that's how you know things will move. Again, thank you very much, sir. I'm grateful. Thank you, Asif. Uh, uh, now I invite uh, Muhammad Ali Janjua, head of uh, Sales Central Zone for the Fertilizer Company, uh, for his opening remarks. Uh, sir, he has some connectivity problems, so maybe we do it uh, after uh, keynote speakers or after a few minutes. Okay, so then we will do it uh, towards the end. Uh, is uh, Dr. Javed after back? Yes, sir. Yes. G Dr. Javed. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, good afternoon and welcome to the webinar on World Day. First of all, I would like to thank all the participants for joining this webinar, which is organized to celebrate World Soil Day, to commemorate soil and uh, raise global awareness of its importance. World Soil Day is celebrated every year on the 5th of December across the globe. This year's FAO theme of World Soil Day is keep soil alive, protect soil biodiversity, which aims to raise awareness of the importance of maintaining a healthy ecosystem and human well-being by addressing uh, the growing challenges in soil management, fighting soil biodiversity loss, increasing soil awareness, and encouraging government organizations, communities, and individuals around the world to commit to proactive improving Soil health. For this year, World Soil Day celebration in Pakistan, we have joined hands with the key stakeholders from both academia and industry to raise the awareness and advocate the importance of healthy soils and raise a voice to keep soil alive, protect soil biodiversity. For today's webinar, Fuji Fertilizer Farm Advisory Services Multan, Mohammad Nawashi University of Agriculture Multan, Pakistan Academy of Sciences partners. And I must global partnership chapter of FAO, the major stakeholder of the worldwide World Soil Day celebration across the globe, and they are also supporting our today's event. To formally start the proceeding, I am briefly uh, presenting today's webinar agenda. We have uh, two to three sessions here. Professor Dr. Ikrar Ahmad Khan, Vain Chancellor, uh, University of Agriculture, Faisalabad, is the chief guest of our today's webinar. Professor Dr. Asif Ali, Vice Chancellor Mohammad Nawaz Sharif University of Agriculture Multan, and Mohammad Ali Janjua, Head of Sales and the Central Zone of FFC, are our panelists. After welcome address by our chief guest, Professor Dr. Ikrar Ahmad Khan, and opening, opening remarks by our two distinguished panelists, the next session of keynote presentation will be moderated by my co-host from today's webinar, Dr. Ansar Farooq from FFC. In this session, we'll have three series of presentation by our international guests. In this session, after the presentation, our agenda includes announcement of winner of national digital poster competition, principally organized by our colleagues from the Department of Soil and Environmental Sciences, Mohammad Nawaz Sharif University of Agriculture Multan, in collaboration with our partner organizations. And hopefully, we'll have a discussion at 
in order to make this webinar interactive invite professor dr ikrar ahmed khan for the welcome address professor dr ikrar ahmed khan uh, okay uh, dr javed thank you very much i think uh, uh, i have already presented my welcome note to the uh, participants i would like to set the stage for technical uh, discussion and uh, presentations but uh, since this is a dominated uh, session by soil experts uh, fortunately we have with us uh, dr manzoor somro who is a nematologist and we all know that nematodes live in the soil biodiversity so uh, before going to the uh, next uh, segment uh, may i request uh, uh, dr manzoor somro who is chairman of eco science foundation and uh, a celebrated nematologist uh, to give his remarks on soil biodiversity with his background on nematodes somro sir thank you very much uh, dog sir and uh, i really appreciate that a number of institutions have uh, joined together including ffc uh, in this very important uh, uh, webinar uh, i think uh, living soils uh, is what we need and uh, because uh, uh, these soil organisms are not uh, very prominent not seen with the naked eye so they tend to get ignored and uh, uh, there is a direct uh, link and uh, i have personally also been involved in some of the projects where we looked at uh, not only the uh, nematode population uh, particularly those nematode populations which uh, have uh, uh, symbiotic uh, bacteria and uh, for some of the insect management but also we did something on uh, soil biomass and that in the context of pesticide use so i think we need to look at the pesticide use and their effects on the uh, soil uh, microfauna and uh, flora uh, that is the key message that i at uh, this stage i want to share uh, i don't want to go into the details but there are a number of studies that are available and i think uh, soil health uh, uh, is important and that will only be possible with the uh, protection of uh, soil biodiversity thank you so much doctor uh, thank you somro um, sahab i think now we move on to to the technical sessions i would ask uh, answer to take over and uh, moderate the next technical session sir i would uh, like to Right. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, so we have a series of three presentations. Uh, one from FAO, one is from uh, University of Cape Town, South Africa, and our third speaker is from uh, uh, Netherlands. But before we go with our keynote speakers, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Natalia that FAO has produced a video uh, creating awareness about the soil biodiversity. So we would like to play that video for the general uh, public. Interactions become interrupted, 
it can cause irreversible impacts for life on Earth, including humans. So, why do we need soil biodiversity? Soils hold many unexpected secrets and perform unseen functions. The discovery of antibiotics has had a major impact on in increasing human life expectancy. Soils hold many other potential medicinal functions and possible cures. The natural association between plant roots and microscopic fungi promotes better plant nutrition and growth, tolerance to soil pathogens, and adverse climatic conditions. Through the natural function of metabolism, soil microorganisms are capable of breaking down and denaturing certain toxic compounds and contaminants resulting from many human activities. Part of CO2 emissions into the atmosphere, derived from industry and agriculture, can be absorbed by plants and stored in soils. Thanks to the decomposition, the, sir, the voice is not clear. For long periods of time. This invaluable service provided by soil organisms is key in climate change mitigation. On the other hand, deforestation, monocultures, and the overuse and misuse of agrochemical inputs degrade and reduce soil's health, diminish resistance to pests and pathogens, and cause biodiversity loss that jeopardize the delicate balance that took billions of years to evolve and specialize. We could not only listen on the natural history of association, specialization, evolution, and adaptation, but also soil's capacity to perform essential ecosystem functions. How can we restore, manage, and conserve something that we do not see directly, and of which we do not have full knowledge? It is our collective responsibility to raise awareness on the importance of soil biodiversity, promote technological innovation to preserve and enhance soil biodiversity, including ecosystem restoration. Recognize soil biodiversity as a key provider of ecosystem services and as one of the main nature-based solutions to face all the current global challenges. Invest in gathering better knowledge about the status of soil biodiversity and functions, including by region and land cover time. And develop policies based on scientific evidence to mainstream sustainable soil management and conservation of rich biodiversity soils across landscapes. Everything that we eat and drink passes through the soil of my own life over and over again. Therefore, we need healthy soils for healthy food, healthy environments, healthy people, and a healthy life. It starts with you. Give a voice to the sound of the living soil. Keep soil alive. Protect soil by your diversity. So thank you very much. So we now move on to our keynote speakers now. Uh, our first keynote speaker is Ms. Natalia Rodriguez Eugenio. She is the Land and Water Officer of the Food and Agriculture Org Organization of the United Nations and member of the Global Soil Partnership Secretariat who are basically responsible for celebrating World Soil Day uh, throughout the world. She holds a PhD in soil science and uh, has over 10 years of experience in soil studies and the promotion of sustainable soil management. And today she will talk about global uh, status of the soil biodiversity and the challenges and the potentialities. So Ms. Uh, Natalia, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation of being here. Let me share my screen. Okay, 
So distinguished participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to be here today to celebrate with you the seventh UN World Soil Day under the motto, Keep Soil Alive, Protect Soil Biodiversity. Soil biodiversity is a cross-cutting issue. It is at the heart of the alignment of several global agendas, such as the Sustainable Development Goals and many multilateral environmental agreements mainly those related to soil biodiversity, food, climate change, and land degradation. Furthermore, soil biodiversity and ecosystem services will be pivotal for the success of the recently declared United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration from 2021 to 2030. To highlight the importance of soil biodiversity and to better understand what our knowledge is and what the state of soil biodiversity is, the Global Soil Partnership and its Intergovernmental Technical Panel on Soil, in collaboration with the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative, and the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, prepared the report I'm, pres I'm presenting today. It is the result of a global collaboration uh, an inclusive process in which more than 300 scientists from all, from all over the world collaborated to produce this report. The report highlights the current state of soil biodiversity, its potentialities, the challenges and the solutions it can provide to today's global issues. A healthy soil is capable of providing most terrestrial ecosystem services therefore contributing to many of the sustainable development goals. All these ecosystem services necessary to sustain life on earth are the result of a coordinated effort by billions of organisms working together and living in the soil. Soil biodiversity is essential for most of the ecosystem services provided by soil, which benefit soil species and multiple interactions in the environment. When we talk about soil biodiversity, we consider all the life below ground, including genes and species to the communities they form. We refer to soil biodiversity from unicellular and microscopic forms to invertebrates such as nematodes, insect larvae, earthworms, and arthropods to mammals, reptiles, and amphibians that spend considerable, considerable parts of their lives below ground. This without leaving aside the great diversity of algae and fungi, as well as the great variety of symbiotic associations between soil organisms with algae, fungi, mosses, lichens, and plant roots. Our soils are home to more than 25% of our planet's diversity. There are more organisms in one gram of healthy soils than there are people on Earth. If we look at this small spoon of healthy soil, we can have many thousands of different taxa, about 200 meters of fungal ephyr, and a billion of bacterial cells. More than 40% of living organisms in terrestrial ecosystems are associated during their life cycle directly with soils. These organisms are part of a vast food web that cycles energy and nutrients from microscopic forms through the soil megafauna to organisms that live on top of the soil. The soil food web involves different groups of soil organisms, starting from litter transformers that include microarthropods that fragment litter, creating new surfaces for microbial attacks. The micro food web that includes bacteria and fungi which decompose soil organic matter into molecules that feed <clears throat> all the soil organisms, including their, their direct predators as well, like protozoa or nematodes. And finally, ecosystem engineers, such as termites, earthworms, and ants, who, who modify soil structure by improving the circulation of nutrients, energy, gases, and water. Soil biodiversity also supports most surface life forms through the increasingly well understood links between above and below ground biodiversity. 
For humans, the services provided by soil biodiversity have a strong social, economical, health, and environmental implications. A lot of attention is paid to above ground biodiversity and the loss. We are every day talking about how many species are we losing in our planet. However, it's below ground where life initiates, and we cannot ensure biodiversity protection and conservation if soil biodiversity is not conserved and allowed to play their key role on sustaining life on Earth. Soil organisms are responsible for many soil functions, from the formation of soil structure to the cycling of nutrients and climate regulations. In addition, soil biodiversity provides additional benefits to humans. For example, soil organisms can be used as nature-based solutions <clears throat> to improve food production in a more sustainable manner, and also can be used as a tool for managed pests in an integrated way and reducing the need to use pesticides and other agrochemicals. Soil microorganisms represent a powerful tool in the management of contaminated soil. Biostimulation and bioaugmentation, for example, are environmentally friendly strategies that we can use to degrade target contaminants. And for example, when we talk about mining activities that have drastic effects on soils, especially in arid areas, we can use an alternative to restore the biological communities of this soil through the establishment of technosoils that can perform again several ecosystem services. Essential actions in the recovery of soil functionality include the addition of organic matter, which together with the action of pioneering plants, favor the growth and activity of soil microbial populations eventually influ influencing the improvement of the ability to produce biomass. And soils are also a huge source of medicines and support our human health. Since the, the, the discovery of antibiotics, our life expect expectancy have increased enormously. There are also a number of studies that demonstrate that the continued and early exposure to healthy soils helps prevent chronic inflammatory diseases such as asthma, <clears throat> allergies, autoimmune diseases, and, this, and depression as well. Yet one third of the planet's soils are already degraded and their state is deteriorated at an, an, an alarming rate. Soil biodiversity loss has been identified as one of the main soil threats across the world. And sustainable soil management practices, erosion, pollution, monocropping, the misuse of agrochemicals and urban sprawl all contribute to the loss of soil biodiversity and the overall soil health. Soil biodiversity loss can have dramatic consequences on food security and nutrition, climate change and sustainable development and cost our pockets a huge amount of money. It is calculated that if we don't do anything to prevent soil biodiversity, it can cost about 14,000 billions of euros in 2050. However, despite the importance of soil biodiversity, there are still key gaps that have been identified in the report I'm presenting today. We lack data on soil biodiversity at local, national, regional, and global levels. Soil biodiversity is not normally included in soil surveys. Only few countries maintain a national soil information system and monitoring that includes soil biodiversity. In addition, we don't count with global harmonized uh, sampling measurement and analysis protocols. And although molecular tools and novel technologies are available, many countries and labs still lack capacity and capacity development programs to adopt them. The global plans for ecosystem restoration that I just mentioned at the beginning of my presentation does not include soil health and soil biodiversity considerations despite their key role. We must harness the capacity of soil biodiversity to improve the sustainable management of the agricultural sector, which has not been considered so far, and also leverage the potential of soil organisms to reduce soil pollution. 
Finally, more efforts are needed to elucidate the relationship between soil and human health. So what are the potentialities that soil biodiversity have and that has been gathered into this report? Soil biodiversity is basically a tool for nature-based solutions. We can use soil organisms to improve food security and food safety by using, for example, biofertilizers, improving nitrogen fixation, or improve plant growth. They can be used also for biological control of pests and diseases, reducing the dependency on agrochemicals. They can be used for environmental remediation or bioremediation of polluted soils and have also a key role on climate change mitigation and adaptation strategies as they are key players on carbon sequestration and the reduction of greenhouse gases emissions. Soil biodiversity can also stimulate the growth and activities of soil fauna that influence ecosystem restoration. And finally, as I already mentioned, soil organisms are key for nu nutrition and human health. They provide vaccines, medicine, traditional medicine, and also the microbiome that helps our bodies to function. So once we have all this information, what are we planning to do with uh, this bunch of, of knowledge? So FAO is uh, thinking to advocating, or is planning to advocating for mainstreaming soil biodiversity into sustainable development agenda and other United Nations agreement. So we are working towards including soil health and soil biodiversity into all these uh, international agreements. We are going to develop a standards protocols and procedures for assessing soil biodiversity at different scales through the help of the Global Soil Laboratory Network, GLOSOLAN. We will also promote the establishment of soil information and monitoring systems that include soil biodiversity as key indicators of soil health. As probably you know, we are developing the global soil information system and soil stat, which includes some indicators on soil health and soil biodiversity will be included into these programs. We will also contribute to improve uh, knowledge, including local or, or traditional knowledge on the soil microbiome through the establishment of the Global Soil Biodiversity Observatory. This will help us to create a global capacity building program for the use and management of soil biodiversity. And finally, we will execute the implementation plan of the International Initiative for Sustainable Management of Soil Biodiversity. But what you can do, because we also, uh, we all have a role to play here to protect and conserve soil biodiversity. In the screen, you can see some simple actions that you can do in your daily life. But the most is important thing is to spread the world. Send your friends, colleagues, family, students about soils and the importance of soil biodiversity and encourage them to do the same. So our actions have a multiplier effect. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much all for your attention, for being here and happy World Soul Day. Thank you, thank you very much, Natalia, uh, for a very useful presentation and also for the wonderful work that FAO is doing uh, to support the uh, sustainable soil management practices. And I must also acknowledge uh, that uh, you had a, a very uh, successful and won wonderful even yesterday. And despite of very busy schedule, you have managed to appear and join us for uh, uh, celebrations of the World Soil Day uh, in Pakistan. Uh, and I hope there will be a lot of questions. So we would request you to keep stay with us uh, for the question answer session that would follow uh, in, the, uh, in the discussion session afterwards, uh, after the keynote presentations. So thank you again. And uh, now we move to our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Dr. Charlene Yanyun Shepers, uh, who is uh, currently a lecturer at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. And she is currently especially interested in adaptation and plasticity of organism responses to climate change and how these responses 
differ between invasive and indigenous species. And to answer this question, she mainly works on spring tails using a multidisciplinary approach, um, uh, incorporating physiology, traditional taxonomy, DNA barcoding, and ecology. And her most recent research is investigating springtails as indicators of soil health in agricultural systems. And today she would be talking about the drivers of the global soil biodiversity change. So please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, just want to confirm, can you hear me and you can see my screen, Ansar? Yes, yes, both things are fine. Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you, firstly, very, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today and happy World Soil Day to all the participants. Um, as mentioned, my name is um, Charlene Janine Skippers and I'm based at the Department of Biological Sciences. And today I want to highlight some of the, the key responses of soil biodiversity to global change drivers or threats. Um, so the five major global change drivers were first identified by the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in 2005. And this report assessed the consequences of ecosystem changes for human well-being. So it serves as a guide for the assessment planning and management for the future. And what was so important about this report was that it's not only identified, but also showed the impact of the five major global drivers of change. And these include habitat change, pollution, over-exploitation, invasive species, and climate change. And the last two of these, invasive species and climate change, has been the focus of my research for more than a decade. The interactions between these global drivers are not well explored, and I'll show you some examples of these. Um, you will also see many of these drivers, um, which are called also called threats in the new state of knowledge on bi soil biodiversity. So these reports are act as guides for us, for our, for our research. Um, these are soil biota, as, as Natalia very nicely mentioned, the uh, soil biodiversity includes small bacteria, nematodes up to mesofauna, such as springtails, mites, and macrofauna, and even the invertebrates such as moles and reptiles. And shown on this screen is soil biota from South Africa. And despite South Africa being only 0.8% of the Earth's terrestrial area, it contains almost 2% of the world's described soil species. And this was a, a huge underestimate. We also have a very large number of endemic species. Um, some groups have been very well studied taxonomically, such as termites, ants, spiders and nematodes, although their functional roles are still understudied in sub-Saharan Africa. Other groups have not been studied at all, such as proturans, diplurans, enchytraids, tardigrades, and many more. And as Natalia also mentioned, this is due to that um, research on these microscopic animals were historically not undertaken, except of course, if they were pest species. So compared to some European countries, for example, we know only a fraction of what is in our soils. And we are also lacking the taxonomic capacity and identification keys for many groups. However, despite these challenges, soil biodiversity research is growing rapidly due to collaborative projects internationally and nationally, and also to our local funding initiatives. Being sensitive to change and being in direct contact with the environment, soil biota are excellent indicators of soil health. So they are very useful in monitoring programs and can act as early warning systems when other monitoring methods can um, lag behind. So my research is mainly focused on this group called um, Kalimbala and I work on the ecology, physiology and taxo taxonomy. And if we were in a room together today, I would have asked you to raise your hand um, to say, do you know this group? And in the beginning, when I started working on Kalimbala, um, only a handful of people knew what they, they were. But however, thanks to increasing awareness campaigns such as the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative and funding from our bilateral projects, the number of hands raised are increasing daily. So shown here are some Kalimbala from South Africa, but also from Subantarctic Marian Island, where I do a lot of my research. We don't always think of these far ranged islands when you think about soil biota, but they actually play an extremely important role on these islands. 
Springtails are, of course, an ancient group of arthropods, um, and they're one of the most abundant mesofaunal groups in the soil. They're important decomposers as they feed on fungal high fee bacteria and dead organic material. They are great model organisms because there are so many species, and we can also test many adaptation um, things about adaptation in the laboratories. They're easy to keep in the laboratory. So let's look at a few soil fauna responses to these global change drivers, starting with habitat degradation. This is a form of, fire is a form of natural habitat change. Soil communities that occur in the soil layer are severely impacted by fires, for example. However, organisms that live deeper in the soil tend to survive these fires. Um, these are pictures from the Cape Floristic region here in Cape Town, where I live. And the, the fauna in the system is very well adapted to dealing with fire. They're quite resilient and even resistant. Communities return back to normal within a few years. However, recently, areas such as um, in Cape Town and all across the world, the intensity and frequency of fires are increasing due to invasive alien plants, making the fires much hotter and more intense than before. So the soil biodiversity that would have otherwise survived are now reducing their survival. Soil biodiversity takes much longer to recover from anthropogenic habitat degradation. As mentioned, intensive agricultural practices such as intensive tillage, overgrazing can lead to compaction and erosion, making the soil food webs much less complex and removing the ecosystem services actually. And evidence from long-term studies indicate that soil biodiversity then take much longer, up to decades, to recover in these systems. The next driver of change I want to discuss is invasive species, and this is actually something that's very understudied below the ground. The invasion process can be divided into a series of stages, and in each stage there are barriers that need to be overcome for a species or a population. So when we look at this figure, if we look on the far left-hand side, the first stage is transport followed by introduction. So a species needs to survive and reproduce to become established. And then when they disperse into the environment, they are regarded as invasive. So for example, an insect needs to be introduced. It has to get to a certain point through a pathway, which can be a person or a ship or a plane. And um, then it needs to reproduce. How do soil organisms then get introduced? Well, it's very easy, as you know, they can be very small, invisible, and this, they mainly introduced through human activities. Perhaps not as present during uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, but usually people move around the world pretty quickly and um, frequently. And they may be unknowingly transporting soil organisms with their cargo, such as fresh produce, or through the um, soil animals eggs that can hide in seeds or shoes. And these newly introduced biota can have devastating impacts. However, the risks of the different pathways and the vectors are quite poorly understood for soil organisms. These are some pictures of seeds that are um, how seeds and plants get transported to subantarctic islands. And the second picture shows earthworm eggs in soil. And the third picture shows uh, an invasive uh, Anelipes gracilipes, which is a very invasive um, ant across the world. Invasive soil species can be microscopic, for example, like root rot, which is a soil-borne water mold that produces an infection, which is called root rot. And this plant pathogen is one of the world's most invasive species. And um, it can host more than 500, it has, it's host to more than 500 species. It can particularly affect fruit crops and cash plants, such as avos, pineapples, and eucalyptus. Perhaps the best studied group of invasive soil animals are earthworms. And this is probably due to their relative large size and their ability to act as ecosystem engineers. So there are large impacts on soil ecosystems where they invade. In general, invasive earthworms reduce species richness and the diversity of litter and soil dwelling microarthropods and macroarthropods. So earthworm invasions are quite difficult and it's thought to be more pre to better to be prevention instead of to try to deal with the invasion after. 
um, dealing with these invasive species are very costly and labor intensive. As I also mentioned, invasive ant species can also have devastating impacts and some of them are under the top 100 worst invaders in the world. Again, preventative measures are needed um, rather than control. If you're interested in this topic, this paper by David Coyle and his colleagues is a very nice review of the impact of invasive species um, and climate change to soil fauna. Now, we know that um, we know that species can adapt to change or to warmer conditions, and it's been widely shown for terrestrial insects, but for not, not as mobile soil insects or soil fauna, it is less well known. Field climate manipulation studies have indicated that increasing temperatures and drier conditions could make soil dwelling species vulnerable to extinction. Sorry. The mechanisms underlying the interaction of climate change and invasive species have not been well investigated. Why are invasive species thought to be better than indigenous species? Well, indigenous species are more specialized, they're adapted to local conditions, so they're more sensitive to change. Invasive species are also thought to be more temperature tolerant, and this has been the focus of the study that I'm going to show you in the next slide. Using Kalimbala, we investigated, um, we went to Subantarctic Marion Island. This island is about 2,000 kilometers southeast of Cape Town. So it takes five days by ship to get there. But it is a very small island. It has known indigenous and invasive species, and it is experiencing rapid climate change and a decrease in rainfall. So it acts as a really nice model uh, laboratory or natural laboratory. We compared the desiccation resistance between indigenous and invasive species. So this is the ability of an organism to withstand extreme dryness. Invasive and indigenous springtails were kept at warm and cold temperatures and then exposed to dry conditions. So they differed considerably. Kept under warmer conditions, the invasive species survived longer under these dry conditions than the indigenous ones. The results were also confirmed in a field experiments by Melody McGeoch and her colleagues, where they created these warm and dry conditions using these uh, rain block out sheets. And their results also found a decrease in indigenous springtail density with warmer and drier conditions, while the invasive springtails were not really affected. So these studies show that temperature drought conditions seem to be beneficial to invasive species. We also then investigated the impact of climate change along the east coast of Australia. All I want you to take from this figure is that the, um, the species in yellow are indigenous, and sorry, the species in green are indigenous and in yellow are invasive. And we found that um, using another physiological trait called critical thermal maximum and minimum, uh, we've showed that the invasive species have a broader thermal tolerances in in response to environmental warming. Both groups show little phenotypic plasticity in tolerance to high temperatures. And this means that with global warming, these species can't really adapt anymore. These traits between um, alien and indigenous species suggest that biological invasions will exacerbate the impact of climate change on our soil systems. And these may have profound implications for terrestrial ecosystem functioning. So just to summarize, given the impacts of invasive soil organisms, appropriate biosecurity methods are critical. However, the relative risk levels of different pathways and vectors are poorly understood for invasive soil organisms. And this may limit the ability of officials and regulators to target the pathways that are most likely to lead to the introduction of invaders. Ongoing survey work is needed to, decrease de to increase the detection of new invasive species and understand the risk levels of different pathways. A further issue, as always, is the lack of tax taxonomists trained in the identification of soil organisms. And so the training of taxonomists is a key priority to facilitate the detection of newly introduced species. And we can also use molecular methods to supplement, not replace, but to supplement the identification and early detection of invasive species. Understanding the physiological traits of soil organisms is very important. 
Invasive species have a broad thermal tolerance and in some cases have greater plasticity than the indigenous ones. So although our data show that invasive species should be able to outperform indigenous ones, the effect of competition needs to be tested. And also the comparison of functional roles should also be an urgent research area. Lastly, understanding these responses to these global change drivers is key to improving our climate change forecasting models. Sorry. I also, as Natalia mentioned, we know that the soil biota are efficient model organisms of soil health and they can monitor global change drivers. So using the new state of knowledge of soil biodiversity as a guideline, we now have a unique opportunity to expand and apply our knowledge about soil diversity in the UN's decade of restoration. Restoring the degraded systems will enhance soil biodiversity and ensure healthier soils and a healthier climate. Thank you very much for your attention and the opportunity and thank you also for all um, my colleagues helping colleagues and collaborators helping me in my research thank you thank thank you thank you very much charlie uh, for the wonderful presentation as well as uh, for sharing your research work uh, that is really great to have you i hope uh, and i'm sure that there will be a lot of questions that we will follow in the question answer session and uh, most importantly, I must acknowledge uh, your presence here because uh, I remember our first contact, you informed me that it's birthday of your daughter today and uh, you have somehow managed to appear and uh, postpone it to tomorrow. So happy birthday uh, to your daughter also. So thank you very much for joining us and sparing your uh, uh, valuable time. Thank you very much. Thank so you very much. So we move to our third speaker who is, uh, Dr. Eric Smalling, uh, he is from Netherlands and uh, currently he is uh, working as senior soil scientist at the Wageningen University mm -hmm. and research the Netherlands. He did his PhD on integrated soil fertility management in Africa and served as a professor of sustainable agriculture from 1998 to 2012 at uh, and, uh, and uh, out of this at Wageningen University until 2002 and 20 University from 2004 and onward. And I must also share that Eric remained a member of the Dutch parliament from 2007 to 2017. And currently he is running a large food security program in Ethiopia and a program with IFAD, that is the International Fund for Agricultural Development on their rural development report which serves as scientific input to the UN Food System Summit foreseen by end of 2021. And today he will talk about the current issues in global soil fertility management. So Eric, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Do you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. And th thanks very much, um, uh, Ansar. Thanks so much for introducing me and thanks for inviting me in the first place because it's a special day, World Soils Day. And um, I see that is a large audience. So that also testifies to the, to the huge interest uh, in Pakistan on, on the, the well being, not just of the people, but also of the soil. And what I will do, I will uh, touch on three issues. Um, I'll make a small tour through a number of continents and discuss what is the position of soil fertility and soil fertility management at this time. Then I'll show some examples of, of global nutrient flows that are currently actually dominating much of the, of the international agricultural exports and imports. And then I'll come to integrated soil fertility management, which to me is uh, a, a solution to many issues that may crop up as we move to 10 billion people in this world. And as we move to people um, having more income and changing their, their diet patterns. Um, when I start with my own, uh, let me see, do I do this properly? Yeah. With my own continent in Europe, um, as most of you may know, we have a common agricultural policy that determines largely what farmers do and what farmers produce. It's a, it's a subsidy system. Uh, I think about 25 to 30 percent at the moment of the European EU budget is, is into agriculture. So farmers get some additional funding 
on their agricultural uh, practices, which of course is a subsidy that may be uh, yeah, unfair to other continents when it comes to a level playing field. Anyway, that means that uh, production, but also the use of fertilizers, the use of organic inputs is, uh, is much determined by the policies at the EU level. In terms of soils, uh, Europe has everything. Um, we have a lot of pot soils in, in my country, which you can see here, but uh, Eastern Europe and uh, parts of Russia have um, most, uh, probably the most beautiful soils in the world, uh, molly soils or phaeozems or chernozems, uh, depending on what classification system you use. In, in the Netherlands, we may have these poor sandy soils, but we are a bit of an exception in Europe as we have a very intensive livestock uh, sector and that is mainly uh, leaning on imports of soybean from Brazil, Argentina and the US. And I'll use that example later when I talk about global nutrient flows. Then when we move to Sub-Saharan Africa and to South America, we see that uh, these continents have the, the, the oldest surfaces, so to speak, of the world. And there you see that feral soils, this is a map of feral soils, oxy soils, which are poor soils just due to old age. It's not a matter of them being overutilized, but it's sheer old age that uh, has turned these landscapes into feral soils. And you can still see also somehow how Africa and South America at some point drifted apart here. Um, this is the, the appearance of these soils, of course. And as you can see here, we have at the, at the world level, we have about 110 tons of carbon per meter per hectare. But Africa and particularly West Africa have only about half of this. And when you look at tea systems in Kenya and India, you also see that the differences are substantial. Uh, often, and uh, when I look at correlation studies where soil properties are correlated to, to crop yields, organic carbon and pH mostly stand out as the most significant indicators of, uh, of crop performance and potential crop performance. But here you can also see that uh, European soils generally have, have twice as much organic carbon in the topsoil as sub-Saharan African soils. And pH is, is at least one unit above sub-Saharan African soil. So the acidity problem in sub-Saharan Africa is obvious. In Africa, some systems are low inputs, but still look, look clever and look uh, adapted to the conditions. The, the high production is mostly uh, obtained from, from lowlands, from, uh, from the, the bottomlands. And as you can see here, it's a system in West Africa, which you see in Sierra Leone and the, the areas over there, which, which are wet countries with a lot of rainfall, where rice is grown in, in this way, um, through the nursery system to the field. And then after the rice has been harvested, a second crop is grown where first mounds are made. So actually you, you, what you do is you double the organic matter layer by making these mounds. Then you avoid uh, wet feet for the next crop. And like here, ground nuts is a second crop. So there is also some benefit from biological nitrogen fixation. So these this kind of systems are, are very nice to watch how people have developed them. Yet uh, they are low input systems. Well, Asia is a, is a different story, of course, altogether. You have your water tower due to geological history. Of course, the Himalaya uh, came into being because the, the South Asian subcontinent uh, ran into what was, uh, what was Asia before. So that is also the, uh, the history of your high production rice-based systems, of course, with multiple cropping. And, um, and being really the grain basket for rice at a at worldwide level. Um, what, what makes Asia a lot different from, from the African systems is that your response to fertilizers has uh, also uh, made yields a lot higher because you were able to use high yielding varieties. But what you see in this graph is that when you apply uh, just urea, the 300-00 treatment, you see that the plant nutrient uptake uh, increases for nitrogen, but also for P and for K. And the next one, 344.0, you see that the, the, P, the P uptake increases, but also the K uptake increases. And what I want to show with this picture is, I think what is typical for most high, product, high productivity Asian systems, is that the moment you apply a fertilizer of a certain nutrient, 
you also withdraw the other nutrients increasingly from the soils. So you may solve one problem, but then the system gets limited by the next nutrient. So by solving your nitrogen problem, the system becomes limited by phosphorus. Then by solving the phosphorus problem, your system becomes limited by potassium and then by zinc and perhaps by other micronutrients. At the same time, of course, your yields are, are, are sky high, which in this case, uh, more than eight tons per hectare in the, in the fully fertilized system. Uh, for your just for an indication, this is 10 times what West African farmers get from sorghum or millet production fields. Well, just to, to generalize, uh, South America and Asia have some comparative advantages over Sub-Saharan Africa. That is, South America has the high production per unit labor. I mean, farms are, 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 are very, very large. I must make a difference in South America between, let's say, Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, Argentina, the, the flatlands and the, the lands that are bordering the Amazonian versus the Andes, where you have small farming systems in Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, which are not, not these large landscapes. And in Asia, of course, you have the per unit land productivity has increased enormously. But Sub-Saharan Africa is lagging behind. Uh, it has several reasons. Uh, there is much less irrigation uh, than in, in Asia. And also there are very many countries and there are 12 countries in South America and more than 50 in Africa. So when you buy fertilizer as a country, you, you miss on the economies of scale. And that is also a problem to make fertilizer uh, economically viable in Africa. Global nutrient flows are increasingly in the limelight, I would say. That is because there is more trade, but there is also an increasing desire, particularly for plant-derived uh, oils. If you can see that in, in, in global trade figures. And of course, some crops are have to be grown in the tropics and are then needed in the temperate zone. So that is, an, that is a normal trade where you offer something and the other part uses it. That holds for cotton and that holds, of course, for tea. But uh, there are two uh, crops, commodities that stand out in particular. That is for Southeast Asia, uh, oil palm that originates from West Africa, but was taken to Indonesia and Malaysia uh, in, in, in colonial times. And now it's the, it's the market, the international market on palm oil is largely dominated by Malaysia and Indonesia. Another uh, kit on the block when it comes to large global nutrient flows is soybean. This is a picture taken from Brazil where you see some piece of biodiversity in the middle of the soybean field. Um, large tracts of land and a, and a major source of, uh, of income to the, to the South American countries at this moment. But what happens, of course, is that first the Cerrado, Savannas and part of the Amazon forest have to be cut in order to make this land suitable for the soybean. And uh, the, there's, there's an additional income, of course, of selling tropical woods to other uh, countries that are exported. The, the next the phase of cutting forests is that you get these pockets of, uh, of fields where first mostly uh, livestock is kept. They are the, the people who, who start using the land after the forest cutting starts to take place. And then the soybean farmers follow. Um, and as you can see here, this is an, uh, a picture from the mid 90s. You see the distribution of soybean cultivation in Brazil. And then 10 years later, it looks like this. So you see the expansion goes very rapidly and also the yields uh, have increased substantially due to uh, investment in research on soybean production and also on the, the nitrogen fixation by soybean. About 80% of the nitrogen in the soybean plants in Brazil is uh, derived from, from the atmosphere. So that means that the, the, the limitation in the soybean system is more in phosphorus than in nitrogen. Well, then this, this soy uh, meal, as it's called, finds its way through the country, uh, through the big ports, and, and much of it ends up in, in Shanghai and in Rotterdam and in countries that have a large livestock sector like this. So it is an example of a lot of soil fertility actually being exported, in this case, from Brazil to the Netherlands and to China and all the parts of the world where uh, animals are kept, but there is not enough feed to keep these animals going. And then we uh, finally, we, uh, we actually eating Brazilian molecules in these places. 
Well, the key to everything is integrated soil fertility management. And this is a figure that I've used for about 20 years. The, the, the essence of this figure is that you have a certain state of soil fertility, but at the same time, there are many ways to influence uh, the status of the soil. And in this, this in one and in two, for instance, are of major importance, mineral fertilizer and organic inputs, organic fertilizer, and a few others. And on the, on the output side, you see farm products that is a desirable output because that is your, your crop and your crop yield. But uh, particularly here in, in the Netherlands, out three and out four leaching and denitrification and uh, ammonia volatilization are, are very undesired outputs in the agricultural systems. And in between, you have the opportunity to cycle nutrients. So uh, as a rule of thumb, which I use when I'm, I'm, I'm teaching students, is that there are three ways to handle your uh, soil system, that is you're either adding new nutrients to the system, you're saving nutrients from being lost, which is mainly in, in anti-erosion measures, for instance, and you recycle what is there in the system. And by doing that, you're serving um, the soil chemical quality, but also the soil biological quality. So this is a rule of thumb, a one, two, three thing, which everybody can remember. So please uh, do so if you didn't do that already. Of course, the, when it comes to mineral fertilizer, it is a cost uh, issue. So there has to be a value chain that is, uh, that is making sense. And that is not uh, like in this case, uh, inefficient and unprofessional. So the, the strength of the value chain also determines what the farmer has to pay. And the attractiveness of investing in, in fertilizing agents is, is much determined by the efficiency of the input value chain. When it comes to organic fertilizers, I'm, I'm, most of my experience is in Africa, where it is, uh, it is grossly underutilized and, and uh, in many countries also not seen as a fertilizing agent. So there is still a, a lot of uh, way to go in order to get organic fertilizers more into the market and more into a, a business case. Um, what happens is that uh, Farmers in East Africa, for instance, where you have uh, the soils are better because you are in the Rift Valley area where there is more volcanism and more fertile soils, and also more highlands where cows that are crossbreds between local Zebus and Frisians and Jerseys do well. And here farmers integrate the livestock system with the, with the crop system. So the, the manure from the animals goes to the plots that are most preferred in order to get uh, good bananas or good uh, napier grass or good uh, other cash crops from the, from the crop fields. In West Africa, what you see is mostly that animals are kept in concentric rings around villages. That is a kind of a negotiation between sedentary agriculturalists and pastoralists, where the pastoralists, uh, in return for, 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 for the animals sleeping here, they, uh, they can buy uh, foodstuffs at a, at, a, at a cheaper price. So actually what is happening here is the, 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 the fertilizing in concentric rings. So you get a, a mosaic of soil fertility and, and uh, of higher and lower levels. Erosion control is, uh, is a key issue everywhere that is known to everyone, but still it's, it's rampant in many places. It takes different shapes. Here you see erosion in the plano soil where the topsoil up to the Stucknick B horizon is uh, removing. And the other one is more Lufusol, Nitisol, where, where the gully erosion type is more dominant. Erosion is uh, visible in the large rivers. Uh, this is the river that, that goes from Ethiopia to Lake Turkana in Kenya. So actually what's happening here is that Ethiopia is exporting uh, precious nutrients for free to its neighboring country. So this is, erosion is not, uh, part of erosion is inevitable but it, it has to be stopped in places where it, it puts a real pressure on future food security. Well, what are the priorities to, to close it off? In my view, when looking at current soil fertility dynamics in the, in the continent, there are a few things here, and that actually is, uh, is almost my last slide. Uh, integrated soil fertility management um, means agricultural production and means food security and employment and income and health. But soil fertility is a, is a finite resource and it's often seen as, as free for all, as Dieu donné, as God given, um, but it is a precious resource. And we as a soil science community 
uh, have to keep informing uh, policymakers that this is the case. And if we don't take soil uh, health, uh, if we don't talk take soil health um, the way it should be, and if we if we are not if we, if we don't take it as a precious finite resource, we will get into trouble and it becomes increasingly uh, expensive to maintain soil fertility at levels that are desirable to feed 10 billion people. Other things that are important are get the most out of fertilizers. I still see a lot of blanket fertilizer recommendations in many countries. So you see farmers applying either the, the, the amounts that are not optimal or combinations of NPK and other nutrients that are not optimal because there is a lack of, of uh, fertilizer recommendation frameworks. Then we also have to move from a, from a linear to a more circular society. So organic resources that are uh, seen as waste flows, but were, which can still serve a purpose in the soil fertility improvement have to be mobilized. And that also holds for crop livestock integration at, at different levels. Then the value chain improvement is key to make integrated soil fertility management a business. In many cases, waste flows that can be reutilized in, uh, in farming systems exist, but there is not enough incentive for young entrepreneurs to turn that into a viable business. Then at all levels, we have to manage erosion, but also acidity. M many times I also see that uh, fertilizer recommendations are given, but soils are, are just too acid and aluminum toxicity is the first problem to be squared. So lime or dolomite is uh, required before venturing into any expensive fertilizer application. The salinity, of course, is also an issue at, uh, in Pakistan, of course, which is of a different nature than acidity, but it is, uh, it, it, it's also a problem that needs to be solved before actually venturing into large um, proposals for fertilizer use. Micronutrients are also important from a viewpoint of, uh, of, uh, of health and nutrition. Um, zinc, for instance, but also selenium and micronutrients increasingly get increasing attention, also because they become increasingly deficient because the yields get up, but the micronutrients are not reapplied in most of the fertilizer mixes that are currently used. So NPK and other imbalances also be, have to be looked into. Maize, wheat, any crop has its ideal NPK ratio in the above ground plant material. And that has to be taken into account also. Actually, what is taken up in the plant tells you more of a story than what is in the soil. And ISFM, finally, is, is more than soil fertility management. You can focus on soil fertility management. But if your crops are not responding to fertilizers, then there is no point in venturing into fertilizer. In West Africa, farmers that grow sorghum and, and millet, or in Ethiopia, farmers that grow teff, they, are, they also want to high straw yields because the animals survive in the dry season on the straw. So they don't want short straw varieties. And so they stick to local varieties. So that has to be taken into account. It's part of reality. Plant protection and breeding uh, are equally important. Access to, to high quality seeds for farmers is as much important as soil fertility management is. So is water management, be it through irrigation or, or other ways of, of water conservation. And the same holds for post-harvest technologies. If half, your, if half of your yield, eh, particularly perishables, goes down the drain before it reaches the market, there's also no point in investing in fertilizer. There's a big gap between uh, <clears throat> this young one and this young one. And I hope we all agree that we have to somehow close that gap. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, for the wonderful pre uh, presentation uh, and sharing your uh, lifelong experience of 30 years working with the soil related to the topics of sustainable soil for, uh, uh, management practices and the uh, fertility related issues across the globe. and. Uh, uh, I can see a lot of uh, hands the students are asking about the questions uh, that would, we would interact in the later session. And I appreciate uh, the concept uh, of that balanced fertilizer use that for the fertilizer company uh, that I am representing today is working since its start for the promotion of balanced fertilizer use and its relation to uh, 
for the healthy soils. That is very important. And in this regard, I would now request, uh, so our next session uh, is we will announce uh, our uh, co-partner, uh, Muhammad Nawaz Sharif, University of Agriculture. They have organized a, a national uh, a digital poster competition at the national level, and they are going to announce the winners today. And before I invite them for that, I would request uh, Mr. Muhammad Ali Jandua, who is representing us uh, from the Forum of Poly Fertilizer Company for his uh, uh, remarks about today's event. Sir Muhammad Ali Jandua. Thank you very much, Chancellor. Thank you very much, Amsa. I hope I am uh, audible. Uh, Dr. Ikrar Ahmed Khan, Vice Chancellor, University of Agriculture, Faisalabad. Dr. Asif Ali, Vice Chancellor, MNS University of Agriculture, Multan. And dear panelists and dear participants. On behalf of Fauji Fertilizer Company, I extend very warm welcome. Today, we are celebrating World Soil Day. First of all, I congratulate all organizers of the event, particularly FFC Farm Advisory Center, Multan team, Dr. Javed Akhtar, Director, Institute of Soil and Environmental Sciences and Dean Faculty of Agriculture, University of Agriculture, Faisalabad and Dr. Tanvirul Haq, Chairman, Department of Soil and Environment Sciences MNS University Agriculture of Agriculture, Multan. I also appreciate the concept of bringing industry and academia together for different issues of global as well as national concern. In this context, I must acknowledge the efforts of Global Soil Partnership and Food Agri Agriculture Organization, which is focusing soil biodiversity in this year's WSD celebrations with the theme, keep the soil alive, protect soil biodiversity. Highlighting the importance of tiny living components of the nature. It has now become evident that we need healthy soils for healthy life with vibrant ecosystem that allow our food system to be more resilient. Focus soil biodiversity emphasis the need to change the way we connect with our nature because these invisible organisms play a crucial role in sustaining our planet in many ways for example providing our food supporting our health our ways of living and also our well-being soil is regarded as mother of agriculture mother of life because soils are major reservoir of global biodiversity and the loss of soil biodiversity is one of the major threats in many regions across the globe unfortunately there is a limited understanding of ecosystem function and service and consequently the contribution of specific biodiversity components to the production system and if you really think about Resilient food system, we need to better understand the complexity of interaction between the all elements of our nature and our soil. Herein, I'm looking forward to talks about the status, challenges, and potentialities of the global soil biodiversity. Knowing more about current issues in global soil fertility management is another important aspect of today's event. In this context, FFC is meticulously following the mission statement, taking a lead role in the agriculture and industrial development by delivering premium products and services while maintaining high level of environmental and social responsibility. The company's farmer friendly policies and strategy of serving the farmer community has helped in winning tremendous popularity in farming community and its brand Sona 
is the best selling premium fertilizer brand in country. FFC is not only selling fertilizer, but also plays an active role in achieving sustainable development goals. Being member of UN Global Compact 2020 an internationally recognized forum holding credentials, our mandate, vision, and goal is aligned with international thrust towards a sustainable and prosperous tomorrow. Though business acting and behaving ethically and responsibly, we hold commitment to implement and embed the universal principles of no poverty, zero hunger, and good health and well being. Climate change, responsible consumption and production and environment protection, defining the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals as core to our practices and interventions. Since its inception, FFC is providing free of cost farming, farm advisory services to the farming community throughout the country with major focus on balanced use of fertilizers as component of sustainable and management practices. In pursuit, in pursuit of being modern technology to the farming community, FFC has already been organizing international seminars on important issues like fertilizer use efficiency, dry land agriculture in Pakistan, seed productivity through agriculture extension, and most recently about the importance of zinc nutrition for better crop production and human health. As stated earlier, we keep involving international and national researchers, scientists, experts, policymakers, and other stakeholders in the seminars. Today's webinar is also a continuity of these activities, and I look forward to wonderful interactive session ahead. Thanks for your kind patience and happy World Soil Day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your kind remarks. And uh, we are also thankful that uh, you have spared time and graced this uh, occasion of uh, uh, the celebrations of World Soil Day, a joint venture of uh, industry and academia. So now we move uh, to our last session. Uh, where I would request uh, Dr. Tanvirul Haq from MNS University of uh, uh, Agriculture, Multan. He is the chairman of Department of Soil and Environmental Sciences. And Mr. Tariq Javed, who is the head of Farm Advisory Center, Multan. They would, put, they would be moderating the, uh, the last session. And uh, as part of this session, the most important activity is uh, that MNS University has announced a national digital poster competition uh, because of the ongoing COVID situations and they have received a lot of uh, uh, posters for that and today they are going to announce the winners for, uh, for, from this competition and together they will also take care of the uh, question answer session raised by the participants in the chat box as well as we might take some live questions. So over to you sir. Thank you very much and sir ladies and gentlemen assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. My name is Tanvirul Haq and I'm associated with uh, Muhammad Nawaz Shiv University of Agriculture, Multan. It's a great honor and, and privilege for us to be part of this wonderful event organized to celebrate the seventh World Soil Day. Coming to the point, I would like to mention here that we have organized a national digital poster competition on the eve of uh, seventh World Soil Day. I'm glad to announce that there was overwhelming participation from the students of a number of universities from three provinces. We have received more than 100 posters in the competition. And looking into situation, we have categorized posters into two groups. The scientific posters generally um, have scientific uh, experiment, uh, experimental results and and we had awareness posters. And uh, I'm glad to announce that the many of first semester students, they have participated in this uh, category of poster competition. Our um, uh, judges team included uh, Dr., uh, Professor Dr. Shafkat Nawaz, 
He's a retired professor from the University of Agriculture, Faisalabad. Uh, other uh, judge, judge was uh, Dr. Azhar Hussain from the Islamia University of Bahawalpur. Then there was uh, Dr. Sharukh from University of Agriculture, Peshawar. And they have evaluated all the posters and we are grateful to their efforts. The first, second, and third positions in both cat categories were uh, awarded. And I'm uh, going to announce the winners in the first category, the scientific posters group. And the third pos position goes to uh, Gulam Freed. He's a PhD student at, at the university, at MNSC University of Agriculture, Multan. The winner of second position is Miss Natasha. She is a student, master's student at Comsats University, Vihari. And the third position goes, and the first position goes to Mr. Muhammad Naim Akhtar, who is a, a, also a PhD student at MNS University of Agriculture, Multan. And in the second category, awareness category, the third position goes to Mr. Muhammad Hasib Habib, who is a postgrad student at MNS University of Agriculture, Multan. The winner of um, second position is Mr. Abdullah Kiryu. Abdullah Kiryu is from the uh, Sarkand uh, Institute from Sindh. Sarkand Cotton Research Institute, Sindh. And the first position in this category, an awareness category goes to uh, two contestants, the Ikra Tarek and Ms. Aisha Ali. So they, they jointly shared this position for the uh, poster. And I, I would like to congratulate all the winners uh, for for uh, for participation and uh, winning the competition, their prizes and certificates will be posted to uh, Korea by Monday. And at the end, I would also um, like to uh, show you a few slides having all the posters. The poster quality was very good, and uh, they they were on a. Uh, challenging topics. Next, please. And we have also I mean, uh, published uh, this article which appeared in Business News today and will share with the participants. At the end, I would also like to thank uh, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Asif Ali, who always encourage us to uh, take such an initiative. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So I invite uh, Tariq, Mr. Tariq Javed, sir, head of Form Advisory Center Multan for the uh, question answer session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, as we have seen, this is a very good activity. Uh, today's uh, session was very integrated as well as uh, the we had two universities of Pakistan and the few uh, personnel from uh, from the World Forum also attended these uh, sessions. Now it is time for the question answers. There are so many questions uh, that our participants raised during our these presentations. So I will request uh, uh, the participants. Uh, uh, and also okay sir so we have a lot of questions we have received an overwhelming response by the students and also the scientists and researchers who are affiliated with different universities uh, in the pakistan and they have uh, i have screened few of the questions and i will put forward the questions one by one i would request all the speakers uh, uh, that they identify if it is related to them they can answer it uh, so I would put the open questions, not, uh, they can be person specific or the general one. 
so one question we have received uh, that is the the people are asking do you have uh, any question information uh, any quantitative information on the extinction of soil biodiversity in any part of the world any quantification so uh, i think uh, natalia has presented the status of global uh, soil biodiversity so i would uh, if uh, i would uh, request her that she can come forward and please uh, answer the question Natalia, yes, please, if she is still with us, I have yeah. seen it. Thank you, Natalia. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, indeed, we only know about 1% of soil organisms. So it's difficult to quantify how many organisms we have lost already because we don't know them. So we don't have any number to show here because we still have a lot of work to do to identify soil organisms. Oh, okay, okay. So thank you. Thank you very much. So we move to the next question. Uh, that is, uh, how or what happened to soil biodiversity after incidents of fire? Uh, for example, in the forest, or maybe there are a lot of uh, practices going on that uh, farmers are burning their stubbles in the field. And what happens to the soil biodiversity? How much the damage uh, occurs when such incidents are, ha are happening? Maybe Charlene, you can take over this question. Yes, um, yes, I, I can attempt. Um, what happens when, um, I must reiterate, some areas do have a natural burning cycle, such as savannas or grasslands, or like here in the Cape Floristic region. But in terms of areas that, in farming areas, once you burn um, the stubble, you basically destroy all these net complicated networks and soil food web that has been building up over so many years perhaps you actually just destroy that so that reduces ecosystem services so the idea is to leave um, as much as the soil covered as possible but what also happens after fire is that the soil is then exposed and this increases the temperature dramatically and as i showed in my talk soil organisms are very sensitive to dry conditions and hot and, and warmer temperatures. So you immediately expose them to the stress them out to their thermal stresses and then they will probably not survive. So in, in short answer, it's you're reducing your soil food web and ecosystem services by, by burning. Yes, right, right. Thank you very much. So we move to the next question that is about, is there any study on the extent to which microbes can mitigate abiotic stress like soil salinity, drought, and uh, as abiotic stress related yield loss is major concern nowadays. Maybe Eric related to fertility management or any one of you? I didn't get the full question. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can what you is the, actually the question is related to what is the impact of the soil microorganism on improving tolerance to soil abiotic stresses. Yeah, that, that is, I find it difficult to answer that because it depends a lot on, on what microbes you are talking about. I mean, in general, a, a high and diverse microbial activity in soils is always a good thing. How it impacts on, on soil salinity, I, I, I wouldn't really know. I must say I'm, I'm not really a soil salinity management specialist so perhaps one of the ladies can help me out there yeah okay, fine. I'm, I'm with thank you Eric. Thank you. and uh, next question is that there is huge opportunity loss in the amount of garbage uh, not segregated in cities and just dumped in landfills that's very relevant where uh, they spread all sorts of diseases to the, those living uh, around the area and this is a composting, there is a composting opportunity lost and all of the waste rotting in landfills could be used to generate compost for farmers living in the rural areas. So your comments please about this. Or maybe, maybe Natalia because she has expertise uh, uh, working with the pollution management strategies and something like this. Yeah, I can give you a few words, but I'm sure that Eric also will have a good response for this. Indeed, food waste is, is a lot of energy and water that we are losing. 
and it has a huge potential for improving soil health if we compose it and apply it uh, um, sustainably to the soil. Uh, there are some cities and countries that are developing technologies for recovering all these food waste and to put it back to the soil. Um, this will contribute to stabilize the soil nutrients that we are man uh, mining from the soil and put them back. And indeed, this will benefit soil, bi uh, soil biodiversity and, also, and the overall soil health. Okay, okay, thank you. So I have a list of questions. So I think we should uh, uh, adopt a strategy that we answer those questions with the report that we develop. So I would request all the speakers that we send the relevant question to all the speakers. But there is one question that I'm particularly interested in, and that's very interesting that if you can answer the last question, how much monoculture affects soil biodiversity? And what would you say, is there a link between soil biodiversity and crop diversity? And if so, what would be the ideal model uh, to increase both components? Any one of you? Yeah, I think we, we can all respond to this. Uh, monocropping in this reduce drastically and dramatically soil biodiversity because there is a very close link between above and below ground diversity. If we only have one crop growing on an extense area, we will reduce drastically the diversity below ground. And this will have an impact in the whole cycle and uh, nutrient cycle of soils, uh, altering nutrient balances, altering water capacity in soils. So indeed, Monocropping is one of the major impacts to soil biodiversity, I must say. But maybe Charlene and Eric also want to, to make some comments on. Please unmute yourself, Charlene. Sorry, that's the 2020 word of 2020, unmute yourself. Um, yes, in terms of the below ground microarthropods, um, the the, one of the principles of conservation agriculture is to, to have crop rotation and crop diversity. This enables um, better microhabitat for all the, all the animals under the soil. It gives them a large diversity of uh, resources to choose from. But the most important um, is to just have this microhabitat to get this whole complex system and food web um, healthy and um, functioning. Okay, so thank you everyone. So we are uh, just to close. Uh, in the before we close, the, I would request every everyone, all the panel members, that please uh, switch on their videos. We would like to have a, uh, a group photo, all the panel members, and in the end, there would be a vote of thanks by Dr. Ikrar Sai. Please, everyone, uh, switch on your videos. Usman, your video is still not coming, and also Nihal. Thank you very much. So I would now request uh, Professor Dr. Javed Akhtar, Dean Faculty of Agriculture, University of Agriculture, Faisalabad, to please uh, close the session by inviting the chief guest. And thank you very much. Uh, at the end of the session, I would like to invite our chief guest, Professor Dr. Ikrara Makhan, for his uh, closing remarks on the discussion on the soil biodiversity. Please, Dr. Ikrara Makhan. Thank you, uh, Javed. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this has been a very rewarding session. Uh, I'm grateful to the organizers uh, for letting me the opportunity to close the session. Uh, uh, Ansar and I have uh, organized uh, quite a few uh, webinars in the past few months, and uh, I believe uh, today's uh, event is uh, unique in itself, uh, uh, addressing uh, very uh, serious concerns of uh, soil biodiversity 
and this is also a player that we are participating in a, in an FAO uh, declared day of uh, world soils. Uh, the, the the topic of biodiversity uh, has been fairly addressed, and uh, we all here stand to learn more about biodiversity. Uh, the three keynote speakers uh, are absolutely uh, uh, right. Uh, uh, people to uh, to be invited and we have uh, uh, listened to them and uh, a lot of good ideas have been presented. Uh, I'm also very happy to note that uh, we had a poster competition and a lot of young people have participated in this uh, event and uh, they must have benefited from uh, uh, lifelong experiences of the keynote speakers. Uh, we, uh, we are faced with serious uh, soil uh, degradation problems uh, and uh, many of them were addressed today. Uh, at least uh, they were flashed and uh, we need to now uh, think over it and uh, find ways and means to address the challenges. With these few words, uh, my gratitude to the uh, entire participation and uh, our uh, big thanks to the uh, keynote speakers together. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So thank you to the all speakers and uh, participants of today. Happy World Soil Day on behalf of Foji Fertilizer Company, uh, Farm Advice Center Muldan, and all our academic par partners, Institute of Soil and Environmental Sciences, University of Agriculture, Faisalabad, MNS University of Agriculture, Muldan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you.